Okay, hello everyone. Um, so today we're very um, pleased to have Helen Santini with us, who is the specialist advisor for juvenile Huntington's disease for the Huntington's Disease Association England and Wales. Um, she's the only person who does this role in the world, so she's quite a special person <laughs> who does a special job. Um, and she's very knowledgeable on juvenile Huntington's disease, and she's been doing this role for quite some time. So very happy to have her here. So welcome, Helen, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Matt. So as Matt said, I'm Helen Santini. I'm the Specialist Advisor for Juvenile Huntington's in England and Wales. And today's webinar is just really going to look at um, a little bit about juvenile Huntington's disease. What we'll look at today is what juvenile Huntington's is, um, as well as genetic testing in juvenile Huntington's. We'll also look at the role of the specialist advisor um, and some of the research that we've carried out looking at the impact of juvenile Huntington's um, on, on the family. As many people listening to the webinar will know, um, in most people, symptoms of Huntington's will start as an adult. However, for some people, it will start at a younger age. And juvenile Huntington's is when symptoms start before the age of 20 years old. Some people might be young children but many will be teenagers when they develop symptoms and some might, people might even be in their 20s or 30s if they started developing symptoms in their later teens. The distinction between adult onset and juvenile onset is, is a bit of an arbitrary one. Um, it's a distinction that's really just developed from things people have written in the, over the years, um, but there's no distinct cut-off. Um, and obviously, zero up to 20 or even 30 is a very wide range of different life stages which also means different issues are likely to arise in this group. So it makes more sense to think of people with juvenile Huntington's as a bit on, um, on a continuum. So you might have some people who are very young children um, who develop at juvenile Huntington's before the age of 10. Um, and some of the things that we, we read about um, regarding the different symptoms um, and other features of juvenile Huntington's might possibly particularly relate to this group. We also have teenagers, so those are people who maybe develop at Huntington's in their teenage years, and they might show a much similar presentation to, to adults with Huntington's disease, as, as my young adults who maybe developed at Huntington's in their late teens, but now in their early in their 20s, or as I said before, even their 30s. And again, they may show a similar presentation to adults with Huntington's disease. So how common is juvenile Huntington's? Well, I think we know that it's a rare condition, um, and that means that few professionals will have encountered many people with juvenile Huntington's in their career. And that's true even for professionals such as neurologists or geneticists who may work regularly with people with Huntington's disease. The younger the person is, um, the rarer it is to develop Huntington's disease. So um, although we have the figure that um, about 5% of all people um, with Huntington's will develop juvenile Huntington's disease, the majority will be towards the older end of the age range. And in England and Wales, we know of about 88 people um, with juvenile Huntington's disease. And that's out of a population of approximately 60 million. Um, and that doesn't quite correspond to the 5% that we um, think have juvenile Huntington's disease. And that would be true, that's also true um, for, for many specialist services, that the, the people they see aren't quite, don't quite meet that, that 5%. There's no single early sign of juvenile Huntington's disease. As with Huntington's, there's often a family history, um, but this isn't always the case. There will also often be physical changes, such as stiffness in the legs, clumsiness of the arms and legs, or swallowing and speech problems. But there's often also changes in um, thinking and behaviour, which in children might be seen at school as declining school performance, for example. But children are changing all the time anyway, and so it can be very difficult to tell whether these are symptoms of Huntington's disease or something else. And I think particularly if you think about some symptoms, such as changes in behaviour or school performance. These can be caused by many, many other things. Juvenile Huntington's can be very different to Huntington's in adults. 
But this isn't true for everyone, but might particularly be true for small children and less true for teenagers who develop Huntington's. So rigidity, which is stiffness, bradykinesia, which is slowness, and dystonia, painful muscle spasms, are more common in children, whereas the chorea, which is the involuntary movements, thinking changes and psychiatric disturbance, are more common in adults. And seizures go in about a quarter of people with juvenile Huntington's disease. So now I just wanted to talk a little bit about the role that I do. Um, so the role of the specialist advisor for juvenile Huntington's is about providing information, advice and support for families affected by juvenile Huntington's in England and Wales. It's also about advice and training for professionals supporting those young people and their families. For example, training for schools or colleges. In England and Wales, we have local specialist advisors who will work in different regions around the country. Um, but mainly work with adults, but they'll have very good knowledge of the local area and services. So the roles work together to support families where there's a young person with juvenile Huntington. We also have youth workers who can work with the siblings to support them. I organise a family weekend once a year so that families can come together and meet other people in the same situation. We've been holding this family weekend for the past 15 years now. Um, we have about 13 families attend, which in total is about 60 people, including some of our advisors and volunteers to help support the weekend. We hold it at a disabled activity centre, which has some amazing activities for the young people with juvenile Huntington's and their siblings. Um, so rock climbing, canoeing, horse riding and swimming. All of the activities are fully accessible, as are the rooms, which is um, and, and sort of the rest of the environment, really which is really important for us that um, everyone, no matter what um, ability they have um, and at what stage of Huntington's they're at, they can take part. The parents have separate sessions to give them a chance to talk properly to each other. Um, some of these are more formal information sessions. So last year we had a, a talk for parents, a session um, run by a neuropsychiatrist. And some are just separate activities um, such as sailing, craft or afternoon tea, which is just giving them another chance to chat. And with social media now, families are able to stay in touch and support each other outside of the weekend too, um, which is brilliant. I just wanted now to touch on um, genetic testing and juvenile Huntington's, because I get a lot of questions saying, with the predicted test, how does someone come to be diagnosed with juvenile Huntington's? And and what's the, the process. So as many people listening will know, um, there are guidelines to predictive testing um, that will say that we shouldn't test children for the gene um, as a predictive test. And the reason for that is that because people usually develop Huntington's as an adult. So people are making that choice as an adult as to whether to find out whether they have the gene or not. Um, but if a child is thought to be showing symptoms of juvenile Huntington's, then a genetic test may be performed um, in a slightly different way. So it's performed as a diagnostic test. Um, but in this case, it's part of a number of tests which are being used to help diagnose Huntington's. We need to remember that the genetic test will only tell someone um, whether they'll develop symptoms, um, develop Huntington's at some point in their life. And it can't tell someone if symptoms now are caused by Huntington's or not. So the doctor treating the young person needs to use other things, so for their clinical assessment of the symptoms, for example, um, to tell if someone has juvenile Huntington's. The clinicians might be cautious about using the genetic test and diagnosing Huntington's with someone who is showing possible early signs. These symptoms might be caused by something else and then the child will be left having had a predictive genetic test without having made that choice themselves. It's helpful to think of it the other way. How would a child feel if they were inadvertently told they had the gene? Another reason why it's really important to be cautious is because it's important to avoid missing other possible causes of any changes. Um, and it's important to remember, as we said before, that some of those early signs could be caused by lots of other things and aren't very specific to juvenile Huntington's, so it's particularly important. But I think what this all means is that sometimes there can be quite a long delay before diagnosis. 
Um, and the research has shown that this can be quite a difficult time for families who don't always feel supported. And we'll come on to that in a minute. The parent and the child may well have different views or feelings about those early symptoms as well. Um, and the whole testing process and the, the, the um, and diagnosis as well. In the next part, I'd like to go through some of the research that we've done looking at the impact of juvenile Huntington's on the family. The original research was carried out in the UK as part of a Huntington's Disease Association project. So we carried out 10 interviews with 12 participants. And this was then extended through the European HD network um, to four European countries. And these were Holland, Italy, Poland and Sweden. Um, and we spoke to 14 participants. And the idea of this was that they were quite different cultural groups, different cultures and different healthcare systems, so that we could start getting a sense of how general the themes were that were being picked up. One of the big themes that families, families talked about was at the time they started to, was about the time they started to notice small signs of something not being quite right. And they talked about how it was really difficult to put your finger on what it was what that was that wasn't quite right. What they were describing were things like the clumsiness, the changes in coordination, losing skills, so maybe changes at school, and, and changes in cognitive performance. And I think the key to a lot of them was about this key of change. Things weren't, weren't staying the same, but things were changing. The families in the European study also highlighted this sort of knowing but not knowing find it really difficult to articulate what it, quite what it was that they were noticing, um, but again describe similar early changes. And interestingly, even without knowledge of Huntington's, um, they described similar sort of, that similar sort of feeling. So for example, maybe where they'd lost contact with the parent who had Huntington. Without a diagnosis, people sometimes felt that they were being told that they're imagining things or felt blamed for some of those symptoms. They also sometimes felt unsupported, so I think we need to think really carefully about how we can increase the support for families during this time in the context of the, 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 the caution that needs to happen. It might be, for example, that if a parent or young person is worried, they could have regular visits with a doctor who knows about Huntington's, who could help monitor any changes in the symptoms that they're worried about. Another theme that came up a lot was about isolation. So people talked about having created an island. Families found that it was difficult for other people to understand what they're going through. But also, they sometimes found it was really difficult to ask other people for help. They felt sometimes as though people had other commitments or they didn't want to burden other people. The young person might become isolated themselves as they became increasingly dependent on the family or maybe in, in, in relation to communication difficulties or changes in behaviour that maybe made um, peer relations harder. It's also important to remember that many of these families have a history of Huntington's, which may have had an impact on the wider family support that's available to them. Half of the participants were also caring for a parent with Huntington's as well. Um, other examples were where maybe grandparents had taken on the caring role due to the main parent being affected by Huntington's. And this grandparent may themselves have had a long history of caring for generations. Siblings weren't particularly highlighted in the main part of the research themes, but have been really highlighted to us, but particularly by our family weekend. They're often offering a vital contribution to the siblings' care um, and need opportunities to be just a sibling while remaining included. They also need support in their own transitions as well as they grow up and become more independent. The next theme was about lack of knowledge and understanding, and this was also a big theme among families in all of the countries that we spoke to. Um, and I'm sure it will resonate with a lot of people who have Huntington's in the family, whether that's um, adults or young people. This is common to Huntington's in adults, but I think it's even more so with juvenile Huntington's. People may know about juvenile Huntington's, but I think what they talked about was people not fully understanding. So the whole, the whole what that actually meant. So, for example, a school might be aware that a child has the condition, but still not really get why they might be refusing to go to school or how hard that whole situation might be for the family. 
It also meant this lack of knowledge and understanding and access to people who knew about Huntington um, often meant that families became the experts. But at the same time, they were still trying to understand the situation themselves. So, for example, how much of the changes in behaviour are due to juvenile Huntington's and how much is just changes in the child for other reasons? Families might also take on a lot of responsibility for medications, for example, when they themselves aren't doctors. Professionals can help, though, and, and other people supporting the family can help, but by being honest about how much or how little they know and really listening to families. One family described a really supportive paediatrician who said, and they said, she doesn't reckon she knows anything or can solve anything, but she just tries things and she doesn't listen to what you have to say. The final thing that all families talked about was support. And I think this was viewed a bit as a double-edged sword, so it, it had to, um, two sides to it. So although some interactions were supportive, some might have created uncertainty, worry, or give or given misleading information, for example, which was less helpful. Good support was support which listened to the family and people who were honest about what they did or didn't know. And some of it was just about good care generally. So things like coordination of services, consistency and good communication. Families found it helpful to have access to services with expertise. They wanted to have access to someone who knew about Huntington's and juvenile Huntington's. And it was also important to have a good transition. And this is when young people move between children and adult services. And this time can be really difficult um, for people to find good age appropriate services. Once you move over to adult services in whatever shape that, that is, often the services are, are focused on people who are much older. Um, whereas the, someone who's moved over into adult services with juvenile Huntington's might be in their 20s or um, or 30s, um, so it's very important to find find good have a good transition. Families also wanted respite options, but I think the important thing here was that it was respite options that they felt comfortable with for their child, um, and also where the young person was happy to go. Peer support was another thing that families wanted, um, but it can be really difficult when families are so spread out. In the UK, um, we've talked about our family weekends, um, but there are also other options such as online message boards, um, social media support, or buddy systems if there are perhaps two or three families in one area. And all of these have worked really well on occasion. We have repeated feedback from the family weekend about how positive it is being able to meet others who are going through the same situation. And often families make comments about not feeling judged or not needing to explain or not feeling embarrassed at the weekend. So finally, just to highlight a few resources that people might find helpful if they want to read a bit more. So the Huntington's Disease Association in England and Wales have um, a book, HD in Children and Teenagers. We also have information on our website um, and also HDEO has some great information on their website too. There's a book published by Oxford University Press on juvenile Huntington's disease. And both the Huntington's the Society of America and the Huntington's Society in Canada have guides to juvenile Huntington's disease, which are available to do download from their website. So thank you for listening. Um, and if anyone wants to get in touch, um, here are my contact details. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. That was very, very good. Thank you for that. <laughs> Um, I think uh, I just listening to your talk, the the research is very interesting um, and how kind of families are impacted. Um, the you said something about kind of families and parents not really knowing that it's in the family and it's kind of taking a long time to get a diagnosis as a result and kind of like a, a lack of understanding basically. Is that do you see that a lot? Yeah, I think it is difficult. I mean, I think sometimes it may be that there's um, a suspicion, but it just needs to take a bit of time as people are sort of watching mm -hmm. and making sure to be be careful to not jump into a diagnos diagnosis too quickly. Um, I think sometimes people are also have gone through a situation where they've maybe been misdiagnosed with something um, previously, whether that's maybe 
autism, dyspraxia, you know, some other um, condition, and then maybe come to the, the juvenile Huntington's diagnosis a bit later. Yeah. Yeah, but certainly I think that sort of, um, those difficulties around diagnosis can take quite, a, you know, can happen to a lot of people, I think. Yeah, and there's not always that connection to, and it's mostly in the father, isn't it? I mean, and there's not always that connection with the father because it might already be symptomatic and heavily symptomatic when when the child's showing symptoms. Yeah, certainly there are some families where you know they because of you know it's from a previous relationship or mm. where they don't have as much contact with the parent um, with Huntington's and where it can come out of the blue. Yeah, very different. Yeah. Well, we appreciate your time, Helen. Thank you, Matt. And overcoming all the obstacles today. <laughs> Technical hitches. Yeah. Thank you, everybody.